Way Bilingual School is a public elementary school in Miami, Florida. It became a bilingual school in 1963 to meet the educational needs of the many Cuban-American children who lived in the surrounding neighborhood. As the first dual language public school in this country, the entire world looks at the school as a model of best practices in dual language and bilingual education. It's a wonderful school, and it's a wonderful school because people expect the children to do wonderful things. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the pride of the people that work here. The students are team taught. Let me hear from some of you. David. Half the day is taught in English. And he was the inventor of the cotton. And the other half is taught in Spanish. Each teacher handles different parts of the curriculum. ¿Qué significa predicciones? Dales. Predicciones es como un decir algo que tú crees que va a pasar. Good morning, Carida. These second graders start their day in English. Good morning, Lucia. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Patricia. Good morning, Roberto. Maria Cantin Fernandez teaches language arts, social studies, Good and morning. English. Good morning, Maria. Most of my students are Hispanic. I have one exception. She's a Chinese girl. They are what we call an ESOL 4 background, which means they have been in the system for approximately about two years, and they're about to exit ESOL. These students will be monitored for two more years after they exit the ESOL program. To teach an ELL student takes nothing other than some second language strategies that are good teaching practices. Oh, yeah. We use visuals, we use buddies, other children to help them. Uh, we use a lot of repetition. We follow that natural language development process that we've done with our own children when they're babies. In this class, Maria will use these five instructional strategies for second language acquisition. Okay, here we go. We're going to start with our I can song. Let's see everybody reading along. Usually, I like to start my day with something musical, uh, something that gets them going, something that they can relate to. This particular rap song, I, it took my interest because it was all very positive. So what I did is I took the rap song, took out some portions that are not appropriate for second grade. I set up at the same time we're doing a reading activity, integrated reading, with a rap song. And it was very good for self-esteem. We know we can, right? Yeah. All right, let's put these away. Patricia, please pass out the books. We're going to read the story, Amelia Badilla. Look through your book. Maria starts today's class with an English lesson on homophones and idioms, which can be difficult for non-English speakers to understand. Can anybody tell me what they think this story may be about? What is, what is this story about? Jasmine, what do you think? A pie. A pie? What about the pie? What about the pie? What do you think the story is about? The story is about Amanda the baby. Amelia Padilla. Everybody let's say it together. Amelia Padilla. Padilla. Look at that. Amelia Padilla. And who do you think? Look through the pictures. And what do you think Amelia Padilla does? What kind of person? Do you think she's a teacher? Do you think she works in a factory? Where do you think she works? I think she works um, doing things what on kind a of house. In a house. What do you call a person who works at a house, helping, cleaning, cooking. What do you call that type of person, that type of job? Claudia? A uh, maid. Can anybody spell that maid? M Melvin? A-I-D. Give me a sentence with M-A-I-D then. The maid 
was came my house. What is the other maid? M A D E, Luisa. I made a pie. And spell maid. Which maid did you use? M A D E. M A D E. Let's listen to the story. And Amelia Badilla gets all confused with the directions that she is left from the, the folks who own the house, the people who own the house. She makes so many mistakes, and we're going to read her story, and some of the things she does is very crazy and very funny. Today we are reading Amelia Bedelia. A lot of repetition is necessary among them, even, with, even just with the pronunciation. And that's why sometimes I also incorporate my voice on the tape where it gives me the opportunity to walk around, make sure they're on task, make sure they're following, and they just need a lot of repetition and listening to the English language, which I suggest to the parents all the time. Go to the library. There nowadays you have books with cassettes, and they just need to hear the pronunciation of that English language. She saw a big box with the word, dusting powder on it. With these old children, I think it's a wonderful thing. They take things very literally. What was the first direction? Let's go to our book. The first direction that was left on the list for her to do. What was the first thing she had to do? Change the towel in the green bathroom. Just here they are learning the language. And at the same time, I find the English language a very difficult language to learn. There's so many idioms, so many homophones. Two words that, that sound the same but are spelled differently and have different meanings. What's that all about? What did she do, Natalie? She cut the towel. She cut the towel. So it brings out and introduces. She, it's a funny way. She's a funny maid. She makes funny mistakes, which I'm sure some of these children have experienced making, you know, silly mistakes. And here is somebody that's actually going through this experience, making silly mistakes. So we talk about how many expressions mean more than one thing. What was the second direction on the list? The second direction. Patricia. Dust the furniture. Dust the furniture. This is dusting powder. Dust the furniture. And whoa, look how it smells. Dust the furniture. And what did she do? She dusted the furniture. Acting she out the story the is one way to contextualize language, to teach language within a context. The context might be indicated by a facial expression, a gesture, or an activity. Dusting powder. What do you think that she should have done? I see dust here. I see dust here. I see dust here. What is dust? What is dust, Claudia? Dust is when something is dirty and you got to clean it up. Dust is usually polvo. Dust when something is dirty. How does your mother, what is one way we can dust the furniture? What is one way? I think I'm silly. That, that kind of helps. If I have to be silly, that kind of helps. Always very energetic. I try to be at their level. I try to keep up with things that they like. What is one way we can dust furniture? Viveka. By cleaning it. Anybody know what this is? In Spanish, if you do. What is this? In Spanish. Un plumero, which is a stick with plumas, with feathers, that you use to take the dust off the furniture. Now that I dusted you, I can undust you. All right? I can take the dust off you using my plumero. My... So what should she have done? What should Amelia Badilia have done when they put dust the furniture? Should she have used a dusting powder? No. What did they want her to do? Young Lee. To take the dust away. To take the dust away. So you use a duster or a plumero. Correct? Yeah. What is the next thing that she had to do? Look it up in the book. Viveka. Put the light out when you finish in the living room. Put the lights out, I finished in this room, Acabe, I finished in the living room, now I'm going to go to the kitchen, put the lights out. What did Amelia Pedilia do, Claudia? 
she changed them and she put it outside. She put the light bulb outside. Here we have a light. What do you think she should have done? Natalie, can you come here? Okay, here we have the lights are on. The lights are off. The lights are on. The lights are off. The lights are on. Turn the light, put the light out. And we can put the lights out over there too, George. Can you put the lights out? Put the lights out. Put the lights back on. So you gotta get them involved. You gotta get them coming up. You gotta get them participating. When she read, put the lights out, Michael Samora. She's supposed to do, turn off the light. She was supposed to turn off the light. We have a lot of Let visual learners. I have some children who need that oral, that kinesthetic. Just, it's not enough for me but to sit up there and talk all the time. Who can help me dress the chicken and put some onion salt? Yep. Visually, they'll remember, I think, for a long time, that chicken and dressing the chicken and the salt and the pepper and coming up and the onion salt, a visual experience that they can remember. We're going to talk about some other things. These are called idioms. How many of you have heard? I've got, you're about to sing, you're in a show. I have butterflies. I have butterflies in my stomach. Are you going to do a show? Oh, and a lot of people are going to be looking at you and you're going to be in the middle of a show. And all of a sudden, like when we go on TV, yeah. right? When we go on TV and you stand up and you go, oh, Miss Fernandez, my stomach. And I say, you've got butterflies in your stomach. What do you think that means? I'm about to be on TV. Miss Fernandez has butterflies in her stomach right now. Does that really mean that I have butterflies in my stomach? No. Oh my God, I have butterflies in my stomach. Dad, you are nervous oh. to be um, are you on nervous? something special. Here's another one. During the hurricane, it was raining cats and dogs. That means that when I look up, you're really going to go, wow, look at that dog. Look at that poodle. <laughs> Last night, it rained cats and dogs, and I got water all over my lawn. What do you think raining cats and dogs mean? That it was raining a lot. That it was raining really hard. That it was raining a lot. Last week, we started learning about words called homophones. Who can share with us what a homophone is? Viveka. Two words that aren't the same meaning, but are, n are not the same thing. Okay, who can help her out with that? Two words, Claudia. They sound alike, but, but they're not the same meaning. But they're not the same meaning. Who can give me an example of a, a pair of homophones? Night, night and night. Okay. Can you give me a sentence using the night with a K? K-N-I-G-H-T. The knight was guarding the castle. The knight was guarding the castle. Who can give me a sentence using the other knight? N-I-G-H-T without the K. Brandy. My mom goes to sleep in the night. My mother goes to sleep at night. All right, we're going to play a little game. We're going to play a little game with homophones. Remember when we did the compound words? Yeah. And you said, I've got, I've got ice, I've got box, and together we make ice box? Yeah. Today we're going to do something similar. We're going to do it with homophones. I'm going to give this side a set of homophones. I'm going to give you the other set. You have to listen. You have to come up and you have to use your homophone in a correct sentence. Are we ready? Yes. My two flowers come. He has a flower and she's got flower. Can you give me a sentence with your flower? F-L-O-W-E-R. I like the flower. What flower do you like? What kind of flower? A rose. Okay. He likes... So, my favorite flower is the rose. Repeat. My favorite flower is the rose. La flor. My favorite flower is the rose. My mom... Good. My mom cooked the flower. The fla flower. My mom used flour... To cook. My mother used flour... To cook and what does she make with that flour? Uh, 
bread. She made bread. She used flour to make bread. Thank you, flowers. I want I. Who has the I, partner? Who's got I? This English crazy language. What do you have? I. What do you have? I. Ooh, homophone, huh? They sound the same and spelled completely different. Can you use your I in a sentence? I see with my eye. Ooh, she's... Try to use only one eye in your sentence. Use this one only. Start with my. My... My little toy has one eye. My toy has one eye, like in that... in that movie of monsters. One eye in the middle. <laughs> I have eyes. I go to the playground because I behave good. Oh, I go to the playground because I behave good. She used it two times, I. Good job. There's a famous ESL strategy. We call it total physical response. And it's based on actually me giving commands to my learners and my learners having to show me that they understand what I say. Like stand up, sit down, go open the door, go open up the window. Basic commands at the beginning of language acquisition. That idea behind that method is to get students actively involved. Low, can, you go? can you go down low? Go down low? All the way to the floor? One of my biggest things that find children have a hard time doing is following direction. Right foot, two stumps. Left foot, two stumps. Slide to the left. Cha-cha. Take out your piece of paper and put your name on your left-hand side. It's a difficult thing to do. And when I heard that song, I said, hey, this is something I can bring into the classroom and incorporate with the learning process. Turn it out. Active involvement refers to language acquisition not being a passive process but being an active one. And so it's through the interaction with other people and through doing, even. Everybody clap your hands. So that it's not just the teacher modeling and doing the demos, but the students doing it after you to remind them learning comes from practice. Five hops this time. And that language acquisition comes from interacting with text, with other people, with materials, with tasks. It happens actively. It's not passive at all. I'm going to give you all five minutes to look through your George Washington, Abraham Lincoln book. We're going to review what we have been doing. Then we're going to play a game. Does the fact belong to Lincoln or what I say belong to Washington? I have a couple seconds to review and then I want to hear you guys reading the reading. I like the way Jennifer started right away reading. I like the way Carolina's reading. Selecting sources that are appropriate for her students' reading and language levels is one way to provide comprehensible input. Okay, let's do this. Let's go to the beginning of the George Washington book, and let me hear you read. Maria also uses nonverbal communication, such as pictures, maps, and graphic organizers, okay, to help her students learn George new Washington words book, as well as the content. Students will grasp the information even if they don't understand every word. The biography. What's a biography? We reviewed that yesterday. What's a biography? What makes a biography something different? What kind of story is a biography? Patricia. Um, a true story about a person's life that another, that instead he doesn't write it down. Right, because if he writes it, what would that be? autobiography. If I write a story about my own life, that is an autobiography. So this biography is about who, Sarah? George Washington. George Washington. Can anybody tell me something about George Washington before we get started? Give me a fact. Something that is true about George Washington. Emily. George Washington was the first president of the United States. George Washington was the first president of the United States, and I like the way she gave it to me in a complete sentence. Natalie, can you give me another fact about George Washington? He was born in Virginia in 1732. He was born in Virginia in 1732. Let's read from the beginning.
begin, Sarah. George Washington was America's first president. He was born in Virginia in 1732. This month we've been doing biography. So we did George Washington, we did Abraham Lincoln, then we tried to incorporate history about our country. He went to a one-room schoolhouse. Children of all ages sat together. Young Lee. Long lived on a big farm called Mount Mount. Mount. Once again, uh, we, we try to incorporate, integrate reading at all times, which some of the students have a difficult time when it comes to social studies, when it comes to the reading. And I try to turn it into a game where they had to differentiate between facts about George Washington versus facts about uh, Abraham Lincoln. He helped create the... Create? To make? To create? Create the Constitution. People set down rules for the new govern government. What was the Constitution? Think hard. Ms. Fernandez kind of has a Constitution up there. Washington had to make a Constitution. Why? What was this? What was this Constitution all about, Melvin? It's about rules. The Constitution was about rules. Why do we need new rules for America? Who was telling us what to do before? Natalie? The British King. The British King was telling us what to do, and we decided we wanted our freedom, and we wanted to decide what we wanted to do. We didn't want the British King, which was on the other side of the world, telling us what to do. So we had to get... What happened? What would happen if we wouldn't have had a constitution? What would happen, Emily? It would be crazy. Everything would be crazy. Everything would be what, Patricia? Everything would be like disaster. Everything would be a disaster. Everybody doing whatever they wanted, people fighting, people getting out of their seat whenever they wanted, people getting up and going to the bathroom whenever they wanted. That's a good word. It would have been a disaster. So they got together and they made new rules for America, and that's what the Constitution was. Let's continue reading. Daniela, anyone in table one? What is perimeter? How do you find out perimeter? For example, this side is four and this side is eight. What? Students at Carl Way must also learn science and math as they learn English. Using the same ELL strategies, Oscar Brito teaches math and the language of math simultaneously to these fifth graders. One of the things we know is that English language learners won't have access to success if they have to learn language first and then learn content. So in the past couple of decades, there's been a real move to, towards what we call a content-based language instruction approach. Students learning science and the vocabulary of science and the patterns of the language of science at the same time so that they're not falling behind academically while they're learning the language. Also, that's sort of the principle of immersion, being immersed in the content while you're learning the language. So those two things go sort of hand in hand, immersion and a content-based language approach. Can us all read these two pages together. Washington, D.C. Sometimes when we were reading, I have certain readers reading one at a time, and every once in a while I would say, okay, everybody read together the same page, only because they will say, okay, I already read, therefore she's not going to call me in a while. So just to keep them all involved at the same time while they're doing something, because it's very easy to lose them. Who can remember, let me put the United States map, who can remember where Washington, D.C. is. First of all, where we are, and where is Washington, D.C.? We are in Florida, we are in Miami, Florida, and I really want to go meet the president, like Arthur. Arthur meets the president, and he had to go to Washington, D.C. to meet the president. So if I'm where I am right now, at Corway Elementary, and I want to go visit the president, where would I start and where would I end? Where would I start and where would I end? Giovanni. Where do you want to go? Where do we want to go? Washington, D.C. We're, we're going to go to Washington, D.C. 
Are you going to travel north, south, east, or west? Northeast, northwest, or south? Northeast. We're going to go northeast. Where is Washington, D.C.? Okay, can we travel then? We start in Florida. And let's see all the states we have to go. We have to cross what? Florida. We have to cross? South Carolina. South Carolina. North Carolina. Virginia. Virginia. And from Virginia, we can get right here to Washington, D.C. Who can remind me why Washington, D.C. is called Washington, D.C.? Where did Washington, D.C. get its name? Natalie? Washington, D.C. was named... Named... Um, Washington, D.C. because it was George Washington's honor. It was named in George Washington's honor. And George Washington is... The President of the United States. The first President of the United States. Let's review Abraham Lincoln and let's get together with the game. Abraham Lincoln. Who hasn't read yet? Who has it right? Randy, you want to start the Abraham Lincoln? He was born in Elon Cabin in Kentucky on February 12, 1809. He was born in Kentucky. Robert, you want to go and find Kentucky? Can we find Kentucky? Can you remember where? Where was George Washington born? Do you remember where George Washington was born? Where? Virginia. He was born in Virginia. Are Kentucky and Virginia two states that are pretty close to each other? Yes. Yeah, they actually touch borders, so they're pretty close to each other. Next door. They're next door. Kind of like Mrs. Rodriguez's class is next door to us. Continue. Life in the world in the wilderness was hard there were many ch chores chores so what are many chores to do what are chores responsibilities uh, responsibility is also a good word what's another word i'm looking for do your homework doing your homework is a chore for most children i'm looking for a word giovanni do a job do a job they're like little jobs that you have to do usually at your house doing a job, a responsibility, work, things you have to do. All those define what chores mean. Continue reading. A finished fetched. Fetched from the creek. 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 What do you think a creek is? What is a creek? Look at the picture. Somewhere in the picture is a creek. And from somewhere in the picture, the creek, they had to fetch water. From where did they fetch water? Look at the picture. Everybody put your finger on what you think the creek is in the picture. There has to be water in it, right? Because that's where they fetch water from. What does it kind of look like? A river. It looks more like a river. It's a skinnier, not deep. It's a body of water, a skinny body of water that's usually not very deep. That was in the wilderness. And they had to go and fetch water water every time they were thirsty or they wanted to watch something. Carolina. Abe was also a great storyteller. People love to sit and listen to his funny tales. For his funny tales. People love to listen to his funny tales, which is one of our homophones, our homonyms this week. What's another word for tales? It's funny what? It's funny what is I'm looking for a word. It's funny. What does tail mean exactly? Story. The word is story. It's funny story. That's why he was a storyteller. Continue reading. Today many people still visit his memorial in Washington, D.C. So if you ever go to Washington, D.C., you can go and visit the Lincoln Memorial, and it looks just like that, except it's humongous, very, very big. Look at the three children standing next to the memorial and how small they look compared to the memorial. Let's close the books. Let's see what we remember. Go around and pass a marker to everybody. 
And English language learners have a lot of anxiety-provoking instances from whether it's the language or the culture or just the shock of being thrown into this environment and not being able to communicate. And what we need to do is to really make sure we create an effectively comfortable space, whether it's pairing students up with other children who speak their language, to make sure that they understand what's going on and that they're going to get through this day to remind them that there have been other students in the class before that didn't speak English, but they do now, just so we get a sense of, of process and time and all things will come and this too shall pass. A sense of if we notice that our students are feeling anxious to try and find out, to connect with them and try to find out what could be causing the anxiety. Is it the language? Is it something cultural? Is it something about the material, something about the task, something in the classroom that's causing this kind of anxiety? I like the way Sara's ready, Carolina's ready. Okay, we, we each have a whiteboard. Yeah. We each have an expo marker. Yeah. This is what we're going to do. Listen carefully. I have an envelope full of facts. Some of the facts belong to George Washington. Some of the facts belong to Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to pick one person. They're going to come in. They're going to grab a fact. They're going to read it to you. And they're going to put it on the correct side. In the meantime, I want you on your whiteboards to write. Is it a George Washington fact? Or is it an Abraham Lincoln fact? For instance, if somebody comes up and says, I am on the $5 bill. Who am I? George Washington. I want it written. The only person is the person who's going to be reading. You're going to write on your whiteboard, George Washington and Lincoln. And we'll walk around and see what you write. The students had to come up. The students had to pick a fact. The students had to read the fact to the class. I was born on February 12, 1809. And they had to place the fact with the corresponding president. Most of it was a way of incorporating reading again. And how many of you put Lincoln? Okay, Maria Moore, erase Lincoln. Let's see what fact you get. Is your fact about George Washington or about Abraham Lincoln? Turn around if the class needs to hear you nice and loud so they can hear you. I did not like slavery. I were hard to outlaw slavery. I wanted the slaves to be free. Remember we talked about outlaw abolishing slavery. Who's the president that didn't like slavery that abolished we didn't read it in the book, but we talked about abolish slavery. What does abolish mean? When you abolish slavery, who remembered what abolish meant? Stop slavery. Stop slavery. He didn't like slavery. Good job. He stopped. Was it George Washington or Abraham Lincoln? We have some facts that are not in the book that we talked about. Maria Mara, who abolished slavery? Do you remember who abolished slavery? Who can help her? She doesn't remember. Lincoln. Lincoln abolished slavery. Okay. Let's try another one. Lucia. Okay, ready? Oh. I helped create the Constitution. The Constitution was a set of rulers. Rules? for the new government to follow. I help make, I help with the Constitution. Let's see if you guys, let's see. Wash. Oh, I like the way he does it nice and big so Ms. Fernandez can see. Ooh. So it was George Washington that helped create the Constitution. You guys are part of the American Revolution, and George Washington is the leader, and you guys are part of the Civil War. 
where Abraham Lincoln was president during the Civil War. Listen to what I'm going to do. George Washington is going to ask Abraham Lincoln a question. If it is a correct question, correctly stated, who, what, where, when, they get a point. For a good, they're going to ask you. If you answer the question correctly, you get a point. Right? And then you ask the question, and they answer. We need the George Washington truth. The George Washington truth to come up with a good question for the other side. Whenever possible, I try to integrate. Obviously, with social studies, it was a lot about reading. So I'm looking at two concepts at the, at the same time. When they were doing the facts, come up, take a piece of paper. They're actually reading. Um, even when they're writing the questions, writing the questions on the whiteboard. How is their spelling being developed? How are they doing? Are they using the verb correctly? Are they using the noun correctly? Is it in the correct order? You will see that still with the students, they still have a hard time. You know, Washington born yeah. when? Who question? What? Where? When? So just in those whiteboards, when they How? were doing the, the sentences, multi things Which? are going on. You know, are they using the, the, the verb noun correctly? Are they using the punctuation? Do they have a um, capital letter at the beginning? Do they have a question mark at the end? Remember your question marks at the end. Verbal interaction refers to the fact that if you're going to learn another language, you need to be able to use it. And so in a classroom, that means very simple principle. We have to have students increase their verbal interaction because they're the ones that need to practice the language. And teachers need to decrease their teacher talk. You use cooperative learning strategies for students to work with one another. We can have students interacting with text, reading pages, and then summarizing it with one another. In an elementary classroom, you can have learning stations or learning centers where children are participating together at a table around a task with some material. So students are not only interacting with one another, but they're interacting with the text and with the task that they have to get done. Are we ready? George Washington question. And you guys should have Abraham Lincoln question. Who is ready to ask the Lincolns a Washington question? Lucas, turn around. How many years did the war last? How many years? Fabian, but I want a complete sentence. In the war, the, the revolution, American revolution ended. Lasted. Lasted eight years. Eight years. Is that correct, Lucas? Yeah. Did the American Revolution last eight years? Yeah. All right. Washington asked a good question. Lincoln got a point. So today, we're going to finish our day. We read how many biographies did we read today? Two. Two. The first biography we read was about? George Washington. And George Washington was our George president. president. And the second biography we read was about? And he was our white president. I'm going to ask you a question. If you can go back in time and you were able to meet George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, stand up and you tell me why you chose George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. I chose George Washington because George Washington and um, helped us to don't have British king ruled by to us. What is that word? He fought for what? For the British king to not to rule us anymore. Therefore, we have, we, we have what? Freedom. freedom. We have freedom. And that is what the United States is all about. Freedom. Very important. That's a good, excellent reason. And the reason, you want to hear why I chose Abraham Lincoln? 
same thing because he, same word we're going to use because he freed the slaves. And I thought of slaves as a very terrible thing. So he helped with the freedom of slaves. Everybody write freedom on their whiteboard. Freedom. I think these strategies work for everyone. This is something you can use for everybody. Freedom for all.